I would like to transition now to our feature speaker for our first session. And I am delighted to introduce Johan Rockström. Um, you have his biography, so you can see who he is. What I want to say a little bit is what I know of Johan, and that is he is a committed field scientist. And this is really important that not only has he worked the theoretical side of his disciplines, but he is also been out there in the field. And as one of uh, the greats in field science, E.O. Wilson once told me, there are too few field scientists in the world. So I am very happy to have you on here with us. He is going to take us on a very fast whirlwind tour, 10 years to transform humanity, a whole earth perspective. And I think, uh, Johan, you're all ready to go. You're there? Yes, thanks, Tom, and okay. hello, everyone. This is a, a great, great opportunity and an honor to, to join you here. I'd like to give you a scientific update and um, hopefully give you some valuable conclusions from where we are in the diagnostic of humanity's future on Earth as inputs also for, for the banking sector. If you take next, please. Now, the starting point for any scientific um, scanning and outlook of our decade to come, but also the decades to come, is the most important message from the scientific community over the last decade, which is the conclusion that we've entered the Anthropocene. We, the modern enterprise of our globalized world, has become our own geological epoch, Anthros for humans. We're exiting the Holocene the warm, stable integration we've been in since we left the last ice age 20,000 years ago, and we have now become the dominant force of change on planet Earth. We now surpass the natural variability of uh, solar orbiting, of volcanic eruptions, of earthquakes. We are the ones determining the state of the planet. So much so that the pandemic is but a manifestation of the Anthropocene. It is a predicted, expected outcome of a globalized world putting so much pressure on all the living systems on Earth that this is what we can expect in turbulence with scale, speed, and interconnectivity at an unprecedented scale. Next, please. Now, we see many consequences of these impacts already today, and you're so well aware of them, so I'll go very fast through the current situation at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming from compared to the pre-industrial average temperature of 14 degrees Celsius on Earth. I try to remind people that 1.2 is a very large, unprecedented pace of warming. It's actually the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. And we see here the last six years, which are the six most warm observed years on record. 1998 is also in, in this group, but the last six years are among the warmest. And what is important to recognize here is how this is distributed spatially on planet Earth. And look at the red zones up in the Arctic region, and I'll come back to this, which is the ground zero today on warming, which is not at one degree, but actually at two to three degrees Celsius warming already today. And if you take the next slide, we have already indications of how this is playing out with not only the heat waves and the floods and the disease patterns and forest fires, but also 2020 with a 38 degrees Celsius observed temperature in Siberia, exactly where we have the massive hundreds of gigatons, billion tons of carbon locked into frozen soil in permafrost. These are the kind of abrupt changes that we are starting to observe at 1.2 degrees Celsius warming. If you take next, please. We have summaries of these impacts already today. I just want to point you to what I find to be the best, uh, really dense and authoritative summary of the United in Science 2020, which gives a run through of all the impacts in terms of disease, forest fires, abrupt changes in ecosystems, and the frequency of heat waves, droughts, and record temperatures. Next. We have um, also a tradition today in the scientific community 
to try and every year provide climate negotiators. So this is handed over to Patricia Spinoza, the head of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, who leads the climate negotiations, what we call the 10 new insights in climate science. This is an effort of trying to hand over the 10 most important scientific advancements over the last year. I won't go through all these 10. I just recommend you to just Google new insights in climate science and you'll come into this. But I still have to mention the three first ones. The number one is that in a few months' time, the sixth assessment of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, will release its sixth report. And as you may know, the holy grail in climate science is the so-called climate sensitivity, which is the magical parameter, which scientifically is the one that all climate models are kind of striving for, which is to answer the question, if we double the amount of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, what's the expected warming on planet Earth? Now, as you may know, for 100 years, that range has been in the order of 1.5 to four and a half degrees Celsius at the doubling of the concentration of greenhouse gases, going from 280 ppm of carbon dioxide, the pre-industrial level, to 560 ppm. We are today at 415 ppm, and we are following a path that would take us to the doubling in roughly 15 to 30 years time, if we do not bend the curve. Now, this range is, of course, a very uncomfortable uncertainty range because it's between 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a manageable future, to a catastrophic future of 4.5 degrees. Now, this year, in the sixth assessment coming out in a few months' time, the range will be narrowed slightly to between 2.3 and 4.5, which is a very significant scientific advancement. It is based on all the... Um, supercomputing power and higher resolution in our ability to represent weather, ice dynamics, ocean dynamics, and how the atmosphere interacts with the biosphere. But still, it's a very wide range. 2.3 to 4.5 is quite uncomfortable for actors like banking sector, insurance sectors, and companies. But what I want to um, reassure you, even before the IPC report comes out, that it is a very important advancement, and it's a range between very dangerous future, 2.3, and a catastrophic future, 4.5. And that is the conclusion that will be coming in a few months' time in the IPCC. But even more important is the following. That uncertainty range, which comes out of our burning of fossil fuels leading to more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, does not include the insight number two, which is that we see more and more signs of permafrost releasing methane and carbon from soils. And it's not included in the range of climate sensitivity from dangerous to catastrophic. And the third insight is that we see more and more scientific publications showing that forests and soils are gradually losing capacity of carbon dioxide uptake. And that is also not included in the climate sensitivity. So if you as bankers want to feel, uh, so to say, reassured in terms of the unequivocal scientific conclusions is that even though there is uncertainty in science, if you add all the elements of evidence, there is zero uncertainty because even the climate sensitivity range between dangerous and disastrous is an underestimate because we're not even including permafrost and all the natural ecosystems, um, gradual loss of capacity of taking up carbon dioxide. So the situation is undoubtedly very challenging. Next, please. This is starting to be well understood. You are in the frontier here. Uh, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report, as I'm sure you're aware, comes out year after year with its risk assessment. If you click next, please. We also see again in 2021 that the upper right-hand risk corner here, which is the assessment of the most likely risks, costly economic risks for businesses and the most impactful uh, impacts, S again, incorporate primarily um, the, our inabilities of acting on climate, uh, heat waves, biodiversity loss, extreme events. Again, the risk assessment, as understood in the private sector across the world, is in the realm of global environmental change and abrupt shifts. And of course, you see infectious disease outbreaks 
up exactly in this risk landscape. Next, please. So we see an understanding. We see a deeper uh, verification that this is well anchored among citizens across the world. That's also, I think, very reassuring for the private banking sector that 70% of citizens in the US, despite how climate change is portrayed in a very biased way in media still today, but still under that surface, 70% of, of citizens are deeply concerned about human caused climate change and want climate action. In the world's biggest opinion poll hosted by UNDP, that number is verified across the entire world. Between 60 and 70% of citizens from China to India, to African nations, to European nations, to South America, are deeply concerned about climate change and want action. So never before have we had such a mature understanding among citizens across the entire world that we are in a climate crisis. Next, please. Now, this is the situation today, but I want to take you deeper down into our understanding by focusing in on this little beautiful blue dot, namely the state of our entire planet. Next, please. Now, this is what I would argue potentially for, for all citizens, but I would like to hand it over to, to as something important for, for you as well, particularly for you, namely the, the, the potentially most important breakthrough in climate modeling over the last year. What you see in this graph is the first time ever a climate model based only on physics and mathematics is able to reproduce the entire cycling between ice ages and interglacials over the past three million years. So what you see here is the entire quaternary period. It includes two epochs, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. And it's three million years on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you see average global mean temperature and the zero point is pre-industrial 14 degrees Celsius warming. The green line is the model simulation and the black line is verification data from ice cores and proxy data from tree rings. So that's the, that's the calibration line. What you see is, and that to me is more than just scientific findings, it, it really takes you right deep, deep into heart and, and emotions basically, that not at one point during the entire three million year journey has average temperatures past two degrees. The, the planet, has remained within a very narrow corridor at the warmest level, two degrees, and at the coldest level, deep ice age, minus four to five degrees. And that's the corridor. The planet has been staying within this corridor despite all the, all, all the forcings from external forcings and has been oscillating in and out of ice ages and interglacials within this very narrow corridor. If you take next, this is... Um, one could argue, the question is, do we really need more scientific evidence uh, to deliver on the Paris Agreement? Just looking at that graph, that we've never been outside of two in the existence of planet Earth in the configuration as we know it, should be, I would argue, enough for action. We also know that the situation for us as our modern civilizations is even more, um, let's say, dire, because this is from that previous graph, the last 20,000 years. We leave the last ice age, again on the y-axis is global mean temperature, the zero point being the 14 degree Celsius pre-industrial level. And look at the Holocene. Look at that blue line, the last 12,000 years, which is the period when we have developed modern civilization. We've been around on planet Earth for you know, up to 200,000 years, but we've been hunters and gatherers, very few million people living in very dire predominantly ice age conditions. But then we enter the Holocene and that's when we invent agriculture and we take off in the modern civilizational journey as we know it. And that world is not even within this corridor, the Pleistocene corridor plus two to minus four, it's within a plus minus one degree Celsius corridor. Plus minus one degree. We are already hitting the ceiling of the whole Holocene corridor. And look at the red line where we're heading. We are on a pathway that would take us to three, four degrees Celsius warming in just 80 years time, a point the Earth has not been in for the past five to 10 million years. Again, do we need more science for action? Next, please. 
Now, as if this was not enough, the, the humbling recognition of this narrow Pleistocene chord, or the plus two to minus four, is particularly deep in its insight because we know why the planet has stayed within this corridor. It's not because the sun has been so gentle to us. It is because the Earth system has such very strong resilience and ability to dampen and, and land softly under stress. And that is proven in this graph. This is from the Global Carbon Project, the authoritative annual assessment of all greenhouse gas flows uh, in the Earth system. What you see on the x-axis here is from the Industrial Revolution 1850 until today. Y-axis, you see annual emissions of carbon. So this is our annual emissions. Above the x-axis, you see in gray, burning of fossil fuels, and in orange, cutting down trees and degrading ecosystems. So this is our hockey stick of pressure on Earth. But is it all of this that has caused 1.2 degrees Celsius warming? The answer is no, because below the x-axis, you see the Earth system response. In dark green, you have the gradual increase of ocean uptake of carbon. In light green, you see the gradual increase of uptake of carbon on land. And it's only the blue wedge there, the residual, which has led to 1.2 degrees Celsius warming, because that's the carbon dioxide remaining in the atmosphere. And of course, you just look at this graph and you see, oh my God, the more we abuse the system, the more planet Earth has been serving us as its best friend by its biogeochemical processes and absorbs more and more carbon dioxide. This is proof that under stress, the Earth system in a resilient state tries to stay within the narrow corridor. And the drama is, if you click again, that we see more and more scientific evidence that the Earth system is gradually showing signs of losing this capacity. Land areas from Amazon rainforest to bark beetle infested Canadian temperate forest to European forest fire and drought infected forest are gradually losing carbon dioxide uptake capacity. This is what makes scientific community really, really nervous because we know that the capacity remaining in the corridor is bounded by Earth system capacity to remain stable. Next, please. Now, we see the connections with the economy, with the banking sector, with the whole financial sector, uh, in, the, in the phenomenally important Das Gupta report that came just a few weeks ago. This is the sister to the Stern Review, the economics of biodiversity, showing what enormous value the resilience in the Earth system has, not only for climate stability, but also for all ecosystem services supporting humans and our economy. Next, please. We have made the first attempt of an update of understanding what is at stake in terms of the risks of crossing tipping points that could irreversibly push ourselves away from the corridor. The first assessment came out in 2008 called the Tipping Elements Analysis, led by Tim Lenton and colleagues at Exeter. Just before the pandemic, we did this update you see here, where we scanned through the 15 known so-called tipping elements, the big biophysical system that we know scientifically contribute to enable the planet to stay within the corridor. And we looked at the state of these systems. Here you see in black the nine systems that show indications of being uh, destabilized, being gradually showing signs of moving towards tipping points. It's not that they have crossed tipping points, but they show signs of slowing down, of increased variability, of, of uh, none, uh, you know, outside of, of average behavior. So this is worrying. But even more important is that we start to see more and more scientific evidence that they are connected with each other. So look at the arrows here and how many arrows are actually connected up to the Arctic. You can see that the ice melt in the Arctic and on Greenland affects the temperature in the North Atlantic, the middle uh, square there on the Atlantic overturning circulation of heat, which in turn has an arrow down to the Amazon rainforest and the rainfall patterns, which affects droughts and forest fires in the Amazon. But it even connects to the temperature of surface oceans down in West Antarctica. So it appears increasingly from the science we have today that what happens in, in the Arctic is like a, 
like a, you know, a ground zero of what's happening across the entire planet. And you recall the first maps I showed you, how global warming is now at two, three degrees Celsius warming up at that sensitive point. So that's a situation that calls for rapid action. Next, please. And that is why in my transition to the kind of the next uh, closing phase here, why we need a framework like planetary boundaries, scientifically defining a safe operating space shown here in gray for all the nine systems that regulates the state of the planet, which is not only climate change, it's also biodiversity, land, water, nutrients, chemicals, stratospheric ozone layer, the ocean stability. We know a lot today of the function of your system. And we have today assessment that four of the nine boundaries are in red and yellow in a danger zone, or even so far that we start seeing risks of tipping points. So this is the, the, the transition we now need to see that can be quantified in terms of science-based targets. And I'll come to that in how this can be operationalized. Next, please. Now, in terms of operationalization, I want to share with you in the banking sector that we are translating Earth system science of planetary boundaries into operational tools at country level, like in Germany and New Zealand, but also at the European Union level, but even at, at state level, like in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. So we see more and more interest among companies, among countries, of taking science into science-based targets to be operationalized to guide both business, cities, and countries in how they can develop within a safe operating space of planetary boundaries. Next, please. This is just to, to show that we can quantify this. We presented this for Jacinda Ardner and, and her government in New Zealand just a few months back in the midst of the pandemic showing how a country can align with planetary boundaries based on quantifications across sectors in, in the economy and, and that this can be a, a complementary tool to policies guiding towards sustainability. Next. But it all has to do with major challenges that also connect not only environment, but also with the human predicament. So I want to also connect this to, to the what I would called personally today one of the most fearful outcomes of our latest assessments. This came out a few months back in a scientific publication linking health with climate outcomes and social instability. What you see here is in color the countries in the world uh, graded according to socioeconomic fragility. This is standard maps. The redder, the more fragile the economies. What you see in black spaces here are the regions in the world that today are estimated to have an annual mean temperature of above 29 degrees Celsius. This is a very important threshold because it's a health diagnostic threshold. Above that point in average temperatures, you are in, in geographic zones with very high likelihood of, of unhealth, potentially threatening and, and mortality risks. So it's not surprising that these Black dots are in very few points in the Sahara Desert with very few people hosted in those regions. But in the hashed lines is in the latest climate modeling, the regions that by 2070, if we continue burning fossil fuels as today, that would be in regions with at least 29 degrees Celsius of mean annual temperature. Just staggering areas and hosting, you know, Brazil, West African nations, Middle East, Horn of Africa, India, Southeast Asia, with an estimated population of 3.5 billion people living in regions where the poorest majorities would actually be threatened, you know, basically threatened to life. And, and that, of course, you don't need much more science to, to recognize the, the risks coming with that situation. And if you take next, the risks are actually increasingly studied. Here is an effort of of showing that even Nobel Prize Bill Nordhaus is underestimating risks for the economy if you allow temperatures to go too high. This is a business as usual assessment putting much better damage functions and social costs of carbon into the economic models, showing in dark red the regions that will lose more than 20% of GDP due to just heat wave impacts. And if you take the next here and just combine the two maps, if you come 
just combine the heat wave map and the, and the below and the lower graph and the economic assessment, you can see a, a very scary interaction of global warming, unhealth, and vulnerability and economic impacts. And you have a recipe for the kind of perfect storms we do not want to see, which can lead to displacement, migration, and conflict. And that, of course, does not stay static in the geographic zones we are, but it could uh, spill over into other parts of the world. Next, please. So we have increasingly scientific publications like this one showing assessment in dark red of the regions that are most likely to see migration due to environmental change. So, you know, you can see a red thread here of how we are not any longer talking about environmental problems. We're talking about interactive impacts of social and ecological dynamics that can have outcomes for economies, for stability, for security, for peace, and for health. Next, please. So this is the journey we have to pass to, to avoid this outcome, following the green pathway here of bending the global curve of emissions and reaching a, a net zero world economy by 2050 to have a 66% chance of landing safely at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. The red and orange lines here are where we're heading. The red was the Paris, the orange are, are the, the latest pledges as we know them. We hope that we'll get um, a major improvement at the Glasgow COP26. But this is the, the journey we're following. The, and you take next here, it is not enough to only decarbonize the world's energy system, which is shown here in gray. It follows actually what we call the carbon law of cutting emissions by half every decade. We also know we're talking of a food systems transition with the brown wedge, the single largest emitter sec sector in the world to become a carbon sink in orange. But we also must recognize that there are no scenarios in the IPCC that takes us safely to Paris without scaling carbon capture and storage in, in orange. And we also need to keep the carbon sinks in ecosystems intact in green and blue. So it is a global sustainability transition, even just to deliver on carbon, on climate. Next, please. Now, I just want to take you through, just, just so you've heard it because you're in the banking sector, so these are the budgets remaining for us to land safely at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming with a 50% chance is 580 gigatons. Now we emit roughly 40 per year. So it gives us, you know, 12, 13 years of continued burning as today. So that's why we conclude that we've entered the decisive decade when we need to turn things around. But if you take the next slide, this is from the latest Shell Sky scenario, which you may be running into in, in your work. And I just want to say that they give the impression that we can sort of say deliver 1.5 by landing at, at a zero um, emissions by 2060, as you see here, and allowing ourselves to emit roughly 1,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide up until that point, which is allowed just because they assume tremendous negative emissions by scaling CCS at 450 gigatons. And if you take the next slide, please, if you click again, most scenarios of the, I, this is good. You can stay, no, go back one. Here we are. So this is uh, an assessment that is overly optimistic because it assumes massive negative emissions and it also assumes tremendous afforestation, actually an area equivalent to Brazil which is the only reason why these kind of scenarios allow the, the global emission trajectory to, to go so slowly that it reaches zero around 2060, 2070. And it's just to recognize that, that the IPCC is the most authoritative source of, of these kind of uh, scientific scenarios. And that when we conclude scientifically that we need to have net zero emissions by 2050 in 30 years time, that is the most authoritative assessment that we have today. And any other assessments are often based on assumptions that are um, unrealistic. And, and in this case, it is uh, about massive afforestation that allows us to, to move much slower in phasing out fossil fuels. Next. Take next again, forward. I think you went backwards there. If you go forward, there we are. 
We also have the economic assessments today quite well established with regards to not only the energy system, but also for the food system. You may have seen this uh, food and land use coalition report that shows that the market value of food, which is roughly 10 trillion US dollars per year in the furthest left here, that's the market value on the market. But if you take all the hidden costs, environmental costs, health costs, you will end up in a situation, even like in a conservative assessment, that the real cost of the food systems is roughly 12 trillion US dollars. So we are cheating ourselves in terms of giving the appearance that we have short term benefits. But in fact, we're causing long term costs that are undermining both livelihoods and planetary stability. So again, into the economic sphere, we have more and more quantifications and tools to assess both on climate and on nature. Next, please. So I just round this off with where is science then able to connect with you? Well, this is really in defining science-based targets. And if you take the next, where we today have the, the, the Global Commons Alliance, which is a network of businesses, scientists, and policy trying to define scientifically through the Earth Commission science-based targets beyond climate for all the planetary boundaries and translate these to operational science-based targets for businesses and cities. And we don't have banks involved here, but this is something that I've been exchanging a little bit with, with Tom that we can actually have. It would be great to see if we have an opportunity to, to engage deeper in this initiative. Next, please. And we do try to also connect this with the exponential roadmaps led by uh, Christiana Figueres on what are the pathways to, to deliver then on cutting emissions by half every decade. And you take next. This is something that we can do. We have so many of the technologies and I think you're, you're sitting so centrally here because you're part of the investment schemes on investing on, on the wedges that can take us to cutting emissions by half across different sectors. And we can increasingly show that this is no longer utopia. We can do this in different sectors. Next. And uh, Nigel Topping leading the run up to COP26 in the Race to Zero Dialogue are, are proving this, that, that business sectors across the world are able to deliver. Next. And of course, we today have a completely new situation with what I call a G3 on climate with the Biden administration, the European Union and China aligning behind science-based targets for net zero emissions by 2050 for the US and European Union and no later than 2060 for China. So this is, I mean, for a banking sector, incredibly exciting how, how the world's three biggest economies are aligning. Next, please. And of course, Mark Carney is the one driving this and, and you have more connections there than I have. But I think it's, it's, it's a mature moment now to see how finance, science, and, and good outcomes for humanity are aligning. And I think COP26 will be a fundamental moment where that whole private finance system for net zero will come forward in, in a way that we haven't seen before. Next, please. So overall, are we in a tipping point? I th think it's uh, the judge is still out there, but there's a lot of pressures in terms of uh, progress and market forces, and you are among them, but also technological innovations and science, indicating that this is a very exciting moment indeed. I mean, it's a bit scary, but it's also a moment of dynamic movement, turbulence and change. And I think now is the time to grasp the opportunity. Next. And thereby, I just leave you with this graph, which is, I think, in my mind, the, the rebooting of putting the sustainable development goals inside a stable and resilient planet inside the safe operating space of planetary boundaries and that that people planet alignment is no longer just rhetorics it really is science-based operationalization and i think that would be wonderful to see even more in in the banking sector and with that i hand back to uh, tom and tia thank you very much brilliant i um just want to invite everybody to ask questions to Dr. Rockstrom. Um, please navigate to the question and answer function on the right where you can share your questions and also upvote those of others. And I will be uh, liaising um, with you on those. Tom. Super, Tia. Uh, Johan, 
One of the things, just as a human who has gone through this pathway, you know, uh, we started having these conversations back at the Copenhagen time out in Greenland, where we were taking senior business leaders. I'm wondering in that arc of experience that you've had, what is it that that has shifted in your own concerns, both in terms of the climate work and in terms of what humanity needs to do? So just first to get a, a delta on your own evolution of understanding and what we really need to pay attention to now. Yeah, I remember, Tom, that, I mean, the first times you and I were walking uh, the the melting ice sheets in Elulisat was even before the first planetary boundary paper was published. I mean, we're talking 2007, 2008. The first planetary boundary paper was published in 2009. Uh, I was at that time gathering Earth system scientists to do the diagnostic, and there was really deep reason for concern already then. And if you draw a line from that point in 2008 until today, you know, the red thread in science, unfortunately, is that we we can say one thing for certain, and that is that we've been underestimating the pace of change uh, right through that period. Things are changing faster than we had anticipated. So everything is basically occurring as we, as we assessed it, but it's happening slightly earlier than we had thought. We hadn't expected coral reef systems to... Uh, cross irreversible thresholds so fast. We hadn't expected the Arctic sea ice to melt so fast. We hadn't expected the AMOC to slow down by 15%. We hadn't expected the West Antarctic ice shelves to cross tipping points as they have. Uh, so so things, we, we knew about them, but they're changing faster than we thought. That's one insight. The other uh, very strong insight is also that I think we underestimated the the abrupt uh, momentum of, of change because right through this period, very little happened. I mean, with Copenhagen failing, and then we lost another five years before Paris and all the enthusiasm there, but very little happened follow up on that. And now we see this, this, this sudden massive mobilization in different business sectors. So I think there's an abrupt positive change there as well. Um, so there is a kind of a mixed mixed bag. Mm -hmm. And if we think about those uh, pressure points where the financial system can really get in there and make a difference, I know you talked to some of the larger structural banks, but as you think about this group of banks working in the real economy, having direct interactions uh, with their with their clients and transforming their businesses, what what strikes you as something that really must be done? I think there are several things. I mean, to, to begin with, I think we should, I mean, nobody can today in this connected digital world of the, you know, of 2021, underestimating the power of, of a collective engagement at, at, at whatever scale. I mean, one, one can have tipping points that can scale positively in, in under, you know, in underestimated ways. That's one. But secondly, I think it's important to recognize that today uh, it's easy to, to jump straight at, uh, at technologies and solutions when, when one should recognize that perhaps the most important thing we can do is talk to each other, is to engage together in conversations. And I think you can be a very important network because you, you engage with, with your customers and, and their friends and families and you know that just just the fact of getting aligning sustainability as as the most preferred desired pathway i think cannot be cannot be done um in a you know you you, you can simply not uh underdo it uh, irrespective of of what scale you're working in so i think i think your alliance can can play a you know an un, you know a larger role than than you can expect in in many cases thanks to the fact that you have a web and and i think that is something that we need to see at this point that that conversation going more and more active mm -hmm. tia oh we've got some beautiful questions coming in so the 
the highest voted question is, what's your view on the possibilities of regenerative agriculture in rebuilding soil and storing carbon? Mm. Yeah, so Tom was referring to my, my field anchoring and actually um, my, my field anchoring is in agriculture. So I've been doing not only hydrology and, and agroclimatology, but I've been working in Africa for almost 15 years with uh, small scale rainfed farming and innovations in small scale farming. And I would say that one of the most promising technologies today for regenerative agriculture is is to transform from our plow-based mechanized agriculture to conservation agriculture which is to learn from nature and to have minimum disturbance of soils so that we learn from nature and we do what nature is doing by having everything from zero tillage to new forms of crop rotations and we can build organic carbon in a very significant way and you can talk to any farmer and he or she will tell you that the, the best thing you can do with your soil is to have organic carbon because it improves water holding capacity, rainfall infiltration, productivity, biology in the soil gives better outcomes for food security and yields. So there is, a, there is really a regenerative agricultural revolution around the corner. We see these technologies advancing and we also see science today advancing something that I would, would call very close to an agricultural revolution, which is, you know, we all depend on annual crops today, wheat, corn, maize, sorghum, millet, that farmers need to plow the land and plant every year. A lot of diesel and a lot of soil disturbance that leads just to loss of organic carbon. But there are institutes around the world that are um, doing ge genetic research on, on perennial cereals. So to have, you could just imagine if you could plant a wheat crop and it can be a perennial with root systems that go down three meters, biomass growing even stronger, and you don't, and you just harvest your wheat four, five, six, seven years. That I think is the regenerative agriculture that we um, may be seeing around the corner. And this is so fundamentally important also because not only can agriculture then turn into a carbon sink instead of being a source, we don't have to expand agriculture because we have to recognize today that we've come to the end of the road of expanding agriculture into natural ecosystems. You know, it's only the natural ecosystem that gives us that green wedge I showed earlier of carbon uptake. All the agricultural land, all the land that we have transformed is a carbon source, is emitting greenhouse gases. So, so the patches, the 50 or so percent of land that uh, is still at its natural state, or at least reasonably natural state, is is still taking up carbon dioxide, and we have to maintain that. Mm. Our next question is, um, where are we with the application of your uh, research on the carbon law? Is it really possible to have a law that governs the global commons, and how does this affect the banking sector? Mm. Yes, yeah, so I, I would um, advise you to have a look at something called the Exponential Roadmap Initiative. So if you Google Exponential Roadmap, you'll, you'll come to an initiative with companies around the world that adopt the carbon law and try to follow that. So not only do what more and more companies in the world are doing to set a net zero target to 2050, but also say we're, we're going to reach net zero 2050 by following the carbon law which is cutting emissions by half every decade. It's, it's, it's really exciting because it, it gives you the possibility as a bank or a company to basically have quantitative targets for emission reductions every year. And, and that is very measurable. So, so that is um, increasingly happening. But I mean, one should be honest here to say we're talking you know, hundreds of companies, not thousands of companies. So again, we need to, we need to scale this. For the banking sector, I mean, I, I think you can do many uh, important things here. I mean, of course, look at your own value chain, but in particular, to set standards in all your, your, your loans and all your investments and all your engagement with customers to say, look, we, we put this as a, as, a, as a criteria for assessing different investment areas, but also in terms of, of guiding customers. So I think there is a... 
um, a kind of a relationship here between bank and customer that is potentially very important. Sure. Um, just a quick question. Have there been studies done on the climate impacts of cryptocurrency mining? And if there are, could you please share them? Yes, there there has been a few, particularly on um, on energy requirements and carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions from from running those computer centers. I couldn't point at a specific study. I know that there that the numbers are are very large. I mean that they can be double digit impacts on on consuming the remaining carbon budget. But um, I'll have to follow up with you, Tom, to try and um, find that paper. But there is there is a study on quantifying, not not today, but potential impacts if we just continue uh, Bitcoin mining. And the final one is net zero already too late. No, net net zero is never too late. Uh, aiming for net zero. The question is: Is it too late? Uh, are, are we too late on the trajectory towards net zero with regard to the risk of crossing 1.5? Even there, I would say it's not too late. I mean, the window is, 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 however, barely open. We're very close to close it. There are many scientists that say that it is too late for 1.5. But my conclusion is still that 1.5 is possible. We are at 1.2. We have three, four hundred billion tons of carbon dioxide remaining in the in the mainstream assessment from the IPCC. If we keep away from the tipping points and cut emissions by half every decade, and 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 have a world that lands at at zero at twenty fifty in thirty years time, then I think there is a chance. There there is a risk of overshoot for thirty forty years that that um, we are at risk of you know reaching one point six one point seven for some time. That will be very scary because we risk losing all inland glaciers and we don't know what happens with Greenland during such overshoot period. But if we stop emitting, then we have a large chance of, of kind of landing gradually at, at 1.5. So I would say it's it's definitely still possible and it's and it's our earth shot. It's it's like the earth shot we have. Thank you, Johan. You know, and, um just I'll add one more for our our banks that are not in the global north. As as you look at the circumstances that they're facing in their own economies, given COVID, what are some of the things that you think could combine both their social work that they're doing and impact with climate impact, so that that way we get this this double premium going forward because. Many of our banks will say we have plenty on our hands in just simply dealing with the with the social and economic concerns of our countries. Yeah, well, that's a very important question, and of course, an, an obvious first answer is is to try and, and 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 make as visible as possible, and preferably even quantify all the co benefits that arise from investments from from bank investments in 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 following the carbon law and and just to take one example we know that if if one puts investments behind renewable energy systems we immediately get a, a co-benefit in terms of air quality which in turn gets co-benefits in the health system so you get and and we know that a pandemic like like covid is a, is a lung infection. So what you want to have is healthy lungs, but you don't have healthy lungs in 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 Lagos or or Nairobi or Addis Ababa or or New Delhi, and and that is um, a vulnerability point that I think is a very strong argument for investments along sustainability pathways. But then I think it's also quite exciting to see how we have increasing studies showing that. Investing in in the in the green investment areas can generate you know more jobs and, and and better outcomes also for the job market and and even for the economies. I mean, there are several studies coming out showing that the green recovery after after COVID can get better economic outcomes. I mean, even if you measure it in in very conventional terms, by by investing in in the new economy. So, I mean, there are many good arguments to be made also from a, from a commercial perspective. 
Johan Rockström, thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciated that you take your time and join us and give us our first uh, keynote and overview of what we need to be thinking about it, both for humanity and the earth. And we will take you up on your Global Commons Alliance uh, suggestion. I think we could really help to provide some uh, insights as banks for uh, what the future of business could look like in some very interesting and new ways. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, and you're welcome, and good luck. Thanks. Bye there. Thanks very much, Juan. So welcome back, uh, everyone. Tia, are we ready to make our transition? We are absolutely. This is brilliant. I've um, That was an amazing uh, conversation about some of the lasting impacts, looking at climate resilience when it comes to banking. So I really do think that we have both the science as well as the analysis and application of a lot of um, you know, Dr. Rostrom and next Kate Raworth's uh, suggestions, but a little bit more on the actual agenda. So as you know, you will see on your C event platform that you've got the entire agenda in front of you. Um, you will be able to determine all sessions that you want to apply directly to your own personal device time, as well as to schedule those tabs specifically for you, whatever you enjoy go through the actual agenda, click on the ones that you want to join, and that will then be as part of your own sort of schedule. Um, also make sure that you check out the exhibitors, the websites, you can learn more about our sponsors, and you can join in all of the sessions like you have today. Um, make sure that you use um, the question and answer sessions. You'll have access to the chat. You'll be able to upvote questions like you have already. Well done and thank you very much for doing that also. Um, there's a link on the actual main page to the networking platform. So please use it to connect and make appointments with each other. The Zoom breakouts are for you to connect and deepen your relationships as well. And don't forget to have fun. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tia. Um, I am really looking forward to hearing more from our members as well. We've got some really important finance for the future sessions, so we'll have a chance to hear from all of our banks. We've got a really nice feature this year also where all of our uh, Leadership Academy, both participants and alumni, are hosting cafes, sessions, dialogues with our, our, our colleagues, so you want to check out that. And the Governing Board Forum will be leading uh, a few discussions that I think will take us into talking about the future of governance, uh, which we, know we want to pay attention to. Um, for me, I'm looking forward to Eduardo uh, Godinez, who's going to bring a perspective from Latin America on what's really different about the return from COVID there. And uh, a number of uh, folks who are in the Spanish speaking zone, we've got uh, full simultaneous translation, Spanish to English, but in that one, it's gonna be English to Spanish. Uh, so just want to recognize that. Um, and many thanks uh, for everyone uh, contributing as we go forward. So we have a cultural moment, Tia, do you, do you have one last thing to say? Um, really, I, I think it's to, to ensure that, you know, in all of this, we have a 24 hour program, pace yourselves, take your time, relax, grab a cup of tea. Um, and as David said, you know, we're not gonna know what time of day it is for you, wherever you are around the world. So really enjoy it. And, um, you know, have that feeling of a global event, um, you know, feel free to join each other's sessions. Um, and, and that's it for me, really. I'll be seeing you in the um, Eastern sessions. Thanks, Tom. We'd like to finish with Mayada. She's a fantastic singer songwriter from Minneapolis who aspires to use her music to make people slow down and find themselves in a story and be hopeful. And uh, it's really great that our folks from Sunrise Banks as well are going to be having learning journey sessions where we'll go make deep dives into really the way that they're banking. And I want you to take the time to do that as well. So let's just end with that uh, and cue over to our music now. And we'll see you all in uh, about 15 minutes for those who are joining us in the Reconnect With Your Peers. What's up Global Alliance for Banking on Values? I hope y'all are having a great conference. Um, I'm Mayada, I am a singer songwriter from Minneapolis and I'm gonna be playing you one of my songs today. Um, it's called Black is Beautiful. And I wrote this at a time when I was having um, 
kind of my own awakening on the fact that like like the racist experiences that I had had growing up and the experiences with anti-blackness that I had growing up were like way more structural and way more systemic than I had been told. And I was coming to grips with that. Um, at the same time, as a lot of my friends, as a lot of um, my community members, it was a lot of mourning and a lot of um, pain at the time. And um, not that it was like new information or that it was like a new thing that was happening, but just my recognition of it was at a different level than it probably had been before. And so um, I wrote this song um, because I knew that I needed it. I knew that a lot of my friends needed it. I knew that um, black folks at large could benefit from something like this if, if they heard it. And um, um, I was really thinking about black children uh, because I knew that I would have needed a song like this when I was a child. And so um, this was me writing to young me and also like at the time me who um, needed this kind of truth telling in, in a song form, I guess, um, to kind of combat all of what was happening and what I was observing, what I was experiencing um, from the world around me. So um, as I sing this to all the black folks who are watching, um, this is for you. Um, this is a reminder, this is an encouragement of the truth that we are beautiful, that um, that beauty is multifaceted, um, that we are resilient, we are worthy, we are brilliant, all of all of the things, we are all the things. Um, even though there's so many ways that the structures of the world do not affirm that truth. Um, I just I just want y'all to like really sit in that and let this wash over you. Um, for those of you who are watching who are not black folks, there is still an invitation for you in this song. Um, Really, I would like for you to consider um, and then act on what you've considered, obviously, um, how anti-Blackness is alive and well in your communities, in your social circles, in yourself, and figure out what you need to do, how you can act, how you can use your power um, to dismantle that and work towards a world that actually affirms all life and actually um, supports all life, including the lives of Black folks. So yeah, this is Black is Beautiful. <clears throat> Rosa Martin Malcolm, all did what they 
God who made us well, and she whispers to you, let it break through, and know your black is beautiful. Nehemiah is brilliant, Nelson's resilient, and with Harry. Oh, oh, oh. 